hacen. Es decir, antes toda esa experiencia que adquirimos de gestión operador lo convertimos para gestionar la, la tecnología electrónica. Entonces, nuestra definición ahora es como un game aggregator, ¿vale? Y actualmente hace tres años que los sistemas así hemos separado. Entonces, el, esta oficina, como veis, hace muy poquito que está, hicimos la inauguración. Como podéis ver, hay cosas aún que están por, por terminar. Y nada, es el primer evento que hacemos en esta oficina. Esperamos que el año que viene sean muchos más, porque queremos colaborar con, con ellos y, y seguir aprendiendo. Creemos que es una forma muy buena de, de aprender, de compartir conocimiento, sí que, es, que para nosotros es, es fundamental. Y nada, agradeceros muchísimo a vosotros la, la, la asistencia a este evento. Y, y nada, para cualquier cosa, después de finalizar el evento, habrá un pequeño pica-pica, ¿vale? Entonces, y nada, estaremos parte del equipo, todo está mantener aquí, es parte del equipo de ingeniería. Así que, por favor, cualquier cosa, duda que tengáis sobre, sobre nosotros, si queréis aprender más sobre nuestro negocio, eh, cómo funcionamos, qué hacemos o lo que os gustaría saber, eh, por favor, estamos a disposición 100% de, de responder cualquier pregunta. Y también como puntualización, si queréis, eh, al final, hacer un pequeño tour para la oficina, para, para ver cómo es la parte de arriba, qué significa esa cámara hiperbárica, por qué la tenemos eh, o, o qué es. Pues todas estas dudas también será, intentaremos resolverlas. Y, y nada, no me quiero alargar, simplemente voy a pasar el, el turno y muchísimas gracias por, por venir a hacer posible esta formación. Gracias. Um, I will switch to English because our speakers have limited Spanish, right? I understood some of it. Yeah, uh, welcome to another Barcelona Youth session. Uh, we are here to talk about the active programming in Java. And before uh, continuing, I want to ask who already knows where, what is Barcelona Youth? Okay, for who is the first meeting with, with, with us? Okay, so I need to do the introduction. <laughs> okay. Who, who are we? We are a non-profit association with almost 2,200 members, and we are legally based uh, in Barcelona since uh, 10 years ago. And we are a group of kids and enthusiasts about the technology, uh, about Java, but not only with it. We also talk about other languages like Kotlin or Scala or cloud technologies or Kubernetes, uh, whatever you are interested. We are open to discuss and talk. Uh, yes, we are we meet regularly uh, during the months to discuss uh, framework and architectures. Usually it's twice a month, but normally uh, so sometimes we have even more uh, meetups. Uh, and well, uh, everything that uh, is useful to grow the community, we are, we are open to hear it. So if you want to follow us, here is a set of uh, QRs. Uh, we are very active in Twitter, posting uh, news and and next meetups and we uh, are starting to record sessions as well and you can find it on youtube also uh, you can find the latest uh, recording for the last conference we organized the jdcnconf that are already available for you to watch and also on Flickr, we also post uh, the images of this conference so if you attended uh, you will probably appear there there's the meetup page and also the LinkedIn, where we also post our events and some other useful, useful stuff. And the website that is not very updated, we need to do something with that, not sure. But it's there. So, no one is taking the issue. Some of the past events we have, we talk about uh, some of the stuff. Uh, technologies like Kubernetes, Quarkus, Docker, TBD, AWS, Archelian, and uh, Spring, and, and many more. Our next event uh, is on December. Yes, it's uh, how to start uh, professionally in the development world. You don't need to speak Catalan to, to attend. 
and it will be in a fishbowl format. It means a, it's a round table where, where every participant is open to uh, share his or her experience, and there is an empty seat that you can occupy and talk about your experience as well. Uh, so we encourage you to, to assist because it will be very interesting if you are already in the programming world and want to help other people to start and also for people that is starting who to move forward. And we also have the next day, <laughs> as you see, we have several meetups in the month. Uh, we have an introduction to te open telemetry and distributed tracing with the members of the, the Open Telemetry Foundation. And it's going to be very, very interesting because we will have some demos and introductions as well. And what else? Well, we thank our sponsor, Alea, um, for, for, for making this possible. And also Jack Brains, that is a regular sponsor of us. And part of uh, this uh, sponsorship is that they provide us with some intelligent license. So if you need one, you can reach us uh, after the event or via Slack, or we, we can make an arrangement if we have any. And yes, we want you to contribute. And if you have any idea, or if your company wants to host an event like this, or anything that you have in your mind that is related with the Java and JVM world, and we encourage you to reach out and uh, contact us. We will have, be happy to, to discuss. Uh, what else? Well, today's event is about uh, reactive programming, and we have uh, two developers from, from Red Hat, from the Vertex project. And the first one is uh, Julien. I don't know who is the first one. You're going to the first time. So our next speaker is Thomas Sajamun. <laughs> He, he is a principal software engineer at Red Hat, and he will talk about uh, reactive SQL access. Reactive SQL access, I forgot to put the title in. So yeah, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, good night, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the Barcelona Jug, uh, first of all, to, to give us the opportunity to talk about uh, the, the things we are developing on the Vertex project, uh, which is an open source uh, project that we we contribute to with Julian uh, uh, as uh, Red Hat developers. Um, Vertex is a reactive uh, toolkit, so it's not um, it's not a server that you have to install, etc. It's just a set of libraries that help you to create your um, application, but you can embed it in um, just any type of Java application. You don't have to build everything with it. Before we start, I would like to to ask. Uh, there are some people who are first to the Barcelona job, but I guess you are not uh, first to to Java. Maybe you you already programming with Java. But how many of you are uh, even just a bit familiar, or also have uh, reactive um, programs in production? Wow, about uh, half 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 of the uh, That's cool. So for the other people, basically what we are going after with uh, Reactive is a way to be most efficient with the resources that we have. That's uh, how I, I would put it. And um, why we need to do that, because the way we create uh, a lot of applications today is not the same as what we used to do 15 years ago. Uh, the way we create them, the kind of application, the way we 
deploy them is, is different and we are going to to talk about that in a in a few minutes um, today I'm not going to show you exactly how you can create full applications with uh, with vertex it's not the purpose of this presentation I'm just going to show you how you can make um, relational database access with the vertex toolkit and even with Java developers, I'm sure every one of you has heard at some point in time about Hibernate, right? Yeah. Or object relational mapping for those who have used other kind of uh, uh, like to do that. Uh, we will see that we also have um, a way to access the database through the um, recent project Hibernate Reactive, which is a child project of Hibernate, which uses um, not the GDBC client, but the Vertex SQL clients. So let's talk first about the, the landscape. Um, I think there are three aspects which, uh, which, have, which have changed since, uh, um, yeah, at least uh, 10, maybe more years. The first one is the, the type of applications. When I started when I started my uh, my career in IT, in IT, I was doing uh, an application for a, a bank. It was uh, uh, management of um, corporate accounts uh, through uh, through the internet, and we had like uh, a few dozen users uh, connected at the same time to the application, right? And what we had is uh, an Oracle database with a WebLogic server, something which is, was at the time very, very common. Uh, most of our interactions were um, saving basically the data that we were editing in, in, the, in the screen, almost as is to the database. And then we have we had um, DBAs to, to, to help us uh, write uh, store procedure, procedures to, to um, transform that data and then create all over data that we could use uh, in return. But since then, there, there are uh, a lot of revolutions. First, we have um, mobile um, devices. So not just phones, but tablets. Uh, people want uh, dashboards with um, events that are pushed uh, as soon as something changes, etc. And to, that's a radically different um, type of application than the, the web application with a few dozen um, uh, uh, clients. So I'm not saying that everything has changed from, from what it was in the beginning to that new type of application with uh, thousands of users for everyone. It's, it's not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is today we have a, a lot more of that, uh, of that kind of application. And even if you're still doing back office application, probably you've been asked to provide some uh, real-time feedback in the browser and things like that. And, 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 and that's something which is now very common. A second way, a second thing which has uh, changed is the, the way we create the application. So as our teams have grown and the feature set has, uh, has increased, um, the, the, we had to find a way to, to be able to manage the, the, the teams uh, and the best way to do that is to separate the teams in smaller, in, uh, smaller groups, right? And uh, when you do that, of course, it's uh, harder to, to maintain uh, a big application like that uh, when you are split between uh, many small teams. So the natural way to architecture application when you do that is to to create uh, microservices and that has some other benefits like the fact that you can um, deploy more often uh, and and also that you can scale only the parts that you really need to to scale and not just the, the whole uh, application a third type of evolution, I think, is uh, the way we deploy the application. So back to my first example, we, we used to have a, a big server with many, many CPUs and a lot of memory. 
and then we could we could deploy something with uh, with like uh, four gigabytes of uh, of it, and it was uh, just fine. And on the on the on the machine, the, the database server was installed on bare metal. The web logic servers were installed on bare metal. We had uh, we had um, um, expensive and reliable machines um, manufactured by I don't know who IBM, Dell, um, uh, Fujitsu, whatever. Uh, and they were very reliable, but they were also very very uh, expensive. And then, as we as we had to deploy more and more applications. Um, uh, the virtual machine facility was uh, uh, was very convenient because it, we were able to share the resources that we had on a single machine, and and also because the machine was virtual, it was possible to to buy um, uh, commodity hardware because if it fails, it's it's uh, possible to quickly, so to speak. Um, move the virtual machine to another um, 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 real machine. So this is the kind of uh, of um, a neighbor uh, that uh, allows to to share the resources that we have. And also, more recently, I don't know if it's the case for uh, many of you here, but uh, more and more people deploy their application to containers uh, where. It's no longer um, uh, like a machine which is split between uh, two or three um, uh, virtual machines, but uh, it, it can be uh, um, uh, many dozens of containers on the same virtual machine. And that is for a reason too, because we want to make the, the most of the available hardware that we have, and it's also a way to deploy those many microservices that we have created. So, If we look at the kind of applications that we had as a stereotype in the past and as a stereotype in the in the in the modern era, um, today basically it's not rare to be given uh, just a few virtual CPUs uh, and uh, maybe just uh, one gig of RAM or even less. And also, your application is no longer connected just to, to a single database, but probably also uses other type of uh, um, sources of data. So some people will be connected to so-called NoSQL uh, databases. Some people will use a, a cache, um, being Redis, uh, Azocast, Hispan, uh, whatever. You are probably also calling uh, external APIs, wherever outside of your company or inside your company, and you have to aggregate uh, all this uh, data. Uh, and again, it's not something which is the same for everyone, and it's not uh, like this everywhere, but I think if you think about your applications today, more or less you have kind of these traits in, in your application which you didn't have in the past. And in this new new paradigm, then there is a need for um, a new way of building applications because the way we used to program uh, applications uh, ten years ago is, in some cases, not suited to to this new paradigm where you have lots and lots of um, uh, sources of data that you have to aggregate and, and deal with. And the reason is that most of the, the, the tools that we use to, to build our applications upon, they rely on uh, thread pools, which uh, is a way to, to you know, uh, control the number of resources that you're using. And in this model, usually you assign a thread per request to handle, right? Um, so on this, um, on this slide, I have drawn three threads which handle the different requests. And I would like to ask you if anybody has any idea of why I put some uh, red blocks inside. Yes. So when uh, when whenever we have to um, talk with an external system, be, being the database and HTTP ser remote service or of Kafka or whatever, when you make uh, some uh, I/O, then you you block your thread and it's not available to handle 
another request, right? And and this is something which is not cheap. You could say, well, it's not a problem. Let's create another thread. But if you do that very quickly, you will pay a lot, a lot of price by uh, switching context between your threads. And also, threads are not uh, just free because every thread comes, for example, with a uh, um, uh, one megabyte uh, stack and, and that costs a lot in the end. The way we do things in the Vertex uh, project is different. We, we use a model which is the event loop model, uh, which I'm sure you've heard of uh, before, maybe, no? Is everyone fine with the event loop model? Yeah, you, you would like to hear more, yeah? Some, you need more explanation about it? Don't feel free, yeah, okay. So the event loop model is something that you probably have heard of in uh, things like uh, GUIs like in your browser or um, uh, application on your uh, laptop. A lot of uh, human machine interaction uh, screens are designed like that. So you have a single thread which handle uh, events one after the other. And on user interfaces, usually that thread is here to, to draw the, the elements on the screen, right? Um, so that's what you have, for example, in your browser, but that's something you also have in uh, something like Node.js, where you have a single uh, event loop that handles your, your events, and your events could be a new request that comes to the server, or um, a request which has been executed in the database and you get the data. So in Vertex, it's, uh, it's that model that's, um, that's um, implemented, but the difference is that instead of saying we just have one event loop thread, we, we have a model for being able to create a few of them, not just one. Because generally on your machines, you have even one, two, or three, or four virtual CPUs, and it would be, uh, it would be a pity if we couldn't uh, make use of all of them. So now you don't have the red blocks because when you are in the small um, in the small blocks, it means that you are you are handling that request, and when you need to make um, uh, an I/O, then you can switch to the following request and 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 deal with it. So to just to recap on that part, the reason why we do that is to to keep the number of threads. Uh, to a minimum and to keep them busy. And that's that's why we implement that model. Um, now, if you look at the, 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 the landscape in uh, Reactive, usually you have implementation for a lot of tools um, in, let's say, new, new storage systems and also um, for HTTP clients, it's easy to find uh, HTTP clients which, which don't block, etc. But for database access, uh, the only thing we, we had in the beginning was GDBC. And, and we had to think about, do, can, we, can we do it uh, differently? But before we, we look at, the, at this, the, we can ask ourselves uh, another question, is, which is, do we really need a relational database for the kind of application that we are talking about, which makes a lot of interactions um, with um, other systems? And indeed, there are many more options that we used uh, than uh, what we used to have. So today, we also have the options to use uh, document-oriented um, um, storage. We have key-value um, uh, storage systems, column-oriented, and and all these type of system that were born in the new era with the idea that there would be a lot of clients and usually the, the, the protocol which which is used between the clients and the server is already designed to implement a, a lot of interactions um, on the same connection. So perhaps it's just that, as, that uh, relational databases are not a good fit for that kind of application and then we should do something else. But the thing is that relational uh, database have uh, arguments. First, um, they've been around for decades and then there are uh, a lot of people who have spent a lot of energy in uh, optimizing them. 
And at some point, people were trying to find uh, features in other systems. I, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, about storing uh, arbitrary JSON data. A lot of people were attracted to, to document data stored to that. But on modern relational databases, it's just a no-brainer. Uh, Postgres does it, does it very well, for example. Another thing that is on the side of relational DBs is that a lot of people have the uh, uh, SQL competency, be it on the develop, um, development side or on the um, um, administration side, right? A lot of companies have internal competencies to manage relational DBs, but not necessarily uh, the competencies to manage um, NoSQL or, or, or other kind of uh, storage systems. So how can we talk with other database system in Java? So first of all, we have the GDBC. Then we we had something called reactive extensions for GDBC. So it's um, an Rx Java binding uh, for for GDBC, which is um, which just as, as a, a layer on top of GDBC with uh, with um, uh, Rx Java extension. So it does not really solve the problem of, of um, minimizing the number of resources. Then we also had in the past something called the uh, PostgreSQL uh, async, which um, we used to support in the Vertex uh, stack uh, because it was one of the first real um, non-blocking client to, to SQL database. And unlike the name suggests, it's also supported MySQL. And, but the real problem with that is that uh, it was uh, written uh, completely in Scala. So it means that if you want to use that, you also have to um, bring the whole uh, Scala sc um, stack in your, in your system, which was not very convenient. Um, today we're going to talk about the Vertex SQL clients and there's also uh, an effort from the, the Spring folks who have, uh, um, let's say, created a, a, new, a new spec comparable to GDBC but for the reactive world. So what's, what's in, a, in the Vertex uh, SQL clients? The Vertex SQL clients they provide you with a set of uh, high-level APIs. So you have uh, an API to manipulate a connection, to create a, a pool of connections. You also have an API to start a transaction, commit the transaction, roll back, etc. Uh, and then you have different implementations of, uh, of these APIs. So the first one, sorry, it's a GTPC wrapper because there are just so many databases out there that we cannot create a real client for every... Uh, well, we welcome contributions, by the way, but, but we, we in the core team cannot maintain a client for every kind of uh, databases. And then we have the um, native uh, Vertex SQL clients, and in this case, it's completely different. We actually uh, open the TCP connection uh, ourselves and then have a decoder for the protocol. And that, that allows for a lot of um, optimizations that we cannot make with uh, GDBC. And then, as Oracle database is always a bit special, we, we also have something for the Oracle database, but I would prefer that you ask me about it uh, later. I want to about it in details in this presentation. Um, the third thing that the um, SQL clients provide is the templates. So we, we talked about uh, object relational mapping, but it's not the only way to escape from the horror of dealing with uh, GDBC interactions. You, usually you, you just want to map a result set to an object. And um, it's not always necessary to have an object relational mapping with, uh, with, uh, with a session that manages the object, etc. You just want to map some data, which is uh, 
in a, some kind of row and let's say transform it to JSON and that's all. And so the templates help you to do just that. It's just mapping a result set to JSON or, or Java object. So first, let's see what um, what we do in the implementation with um, with um, a JDBC driver. So you use the Vertex SQL Client API, but in the implementation, we call the JDBC driver. So that means that because we cannot block the event loop, we have to offload every call to the JDBC driver on a worker thread. Okay, but that worker thread is not used to do everything in your application, it's just used to make the calls to the database, and that's it. So this has an implication because you, all, you of course, have to have at least as many workers as you have uh, connections, otherwise you, you will um, uh, queue all your requests in some, uh, somewhere because you don't have enough workers to, to keep with the load that you're injecting. But the, the good point is that you can take just any any database that has a GDBC driver and work with the API and benefit with the things like the SQL templates, for example. So let me try to show what it looks like, what it looks like. Okay. Uh, is it big enough or uh, should I go bigger? Bigger. Let's see. Okay. Is it good? Okay. Maybe it's too good. <laughs> so here, what you can see is something which we call a, a vertical in Vertex. Uh, a vertical is like your um, the entry point of your application. You extend this class named abstract vertical, and then you implement uh, a start method. That's about it. That's the way you design an, a, a Vertex application if you if you only use Vertex. If you embed it in in Spring or Quarkus, you don't have to, to do that. You don't have to create verticals. You can use our APIs directly. But here it's uh, it's kind of convenient. When I start the application, I'm going to get from the configuration the, the host and port which I want to connect to. And then I'm going to initialize the pool. So does GDBC driver, do, do GDBC driver provide um, uh, connection tools? No, right? They don't. So we have to rely on some external um, connection pool. Uh, and it's the same API for every GDBC client or, or, um, or Vertex native client. But here it will use a, a connection pool which is named Agrol and which is the one that uh, Red Hat develops. But it also works with uh, uh, C3PO and what's the other one? Uh, Ikari. Maybe you, you know that one? No? Anyway, because it's working with the GDPC driver, when you provide connect options, you have to give a, a, a GDPC URL, the user, and the password. And then that's it, you, you specify the number of connections that you want and you get your connection pool created. In our small application, what we want to do is to be able to store some products. And my product just have an idea, name, a price. It's very simple. And because I do everything um, uh, manually, if I want to validate the input from the user, I will just have to uh, inspect the, the product uh, which has been given and verify that, for example, the name is not blank and that the price is uh, positive, right? Okay. So now let's say, uh, let's see how, how we can uh, create um, a product. When we receive a request from uh, our web server, we retrieve 
the, the product entity as a, as a JSON from the HTTP body, then we validate that uh, entry. And if there are no problems, then we can proceed with the GTPC call. And what we do is just a called prepared query, where we specify a query with uh, question marks like we do in GTPC. And then when we execute it, we just give a, a tuple, which is which consists in the name and the price. And when it is executed, we transform the result by extracting the generated keys, which is just the ID here, and we put it back in the in the product um, entity. So let's see how that works. I'm going to Sorry, it's not very convenient with the mic, so I'm going to drop it for a second. Yeah, there it goes, it starts. So what I did in my application, in my uh, main method, I, I added some um, uh, code to start a, a Postgres database in a, in a container. Uh, do you know test containers? Basically, it uses this, but just in an application. Of course, you wouldn't do that in production, but for our demo, it's very convenient. Um, so when it is started, we set up the HTTP server, and then uh, our vertical is deployed, so we can start sending requests. So, if we help you. So the first um, the first product that I want to send to my uh, application is some uh, bread with a price, and let's see what this has done to my application. If I look at the logs you will see that there are, a, there are a lot of blocks which happen on this thread, which is Agro 11. This is actually the thread which is responsible for creating connection because the Agro connection pool has its own threads to create connection. And you see that's what it is doing here because it sets up the, the, the connection. All the logs which you see here, here are about uh, authentication, etc. But so that's where the connection is established. And then once this is done, the it's a bit later. Yeah, the actual statement that I wanted to execute is uh, is handled here. And you see, it happens on the vertex worker thread because we uploaded everything from the event loop that manages the HTTP server to the worker thread. Right, that is what I wanted to show you here for um, the creation of the product. Um, just to show you what the SQL template API look like, if you want to retrieve the product, um, you just call the SQL template API. You provide it with the with the GDBC call, a request, um, a SQL query when you specify the parameters as named named uh, parameters, then you say that you want the result to be mapped to a, a specific class. And this is going to use a JSON data binding from the name of the columns, uh, columns in the result set. And when you execute it, you just say the name parameter ID is the ID which was providing the HTTP request. And eventually, what you're given is, a, is a, an iterator with a single product that you wanted to, to retrieve from the database, right? And indeed, if I execute that here, um, if I try to retrieve product uh, one, I will get the bread that I just uh, inserted in the database. So it's not, it's not rocket science, <laughs> which is strong. Uh, but what I wanted you to see here is that compared to what you do with GDPC, 
it's much more compact. Uh, you can um, um, map your parameters very easily from um, from a name to um, to um, to a value, and map the result sets to Java uh, um, objects um, uh, without too much, too much effort, right? Now going back to the other clients. Um, before we go back to the other clients, just um, um, a few takeaways from what we've seen. On the upside of using the SQL clients with the GDC driver, you have the fact that it works with any database, that you can use any of the APIs that the Vertex SQL client API provides, uh, including the, uh, the template API. And on the downside, you still need to be careful with provisioning because you need to have enough worker threads uh, to to manage your uh, DPC connections and also you will add more threads to the application which kinds of defeat the, the purpose of what we were trying to do but hey if you have to connect to to a specific database that can help you now we'll look at uh, the more specific uh, um, sql client the pg client sorry which is um, a client that uh, vertex manages uh, directly. So in this case, we don't need uh, the agro pool, we don't need uh, the GDBC driver, we only need to open the TCP connection with the Vertex Core library. Uh, and then we have a, a protocol product which is responsible for executing the request that you give and, um, and extracting the results from, uh, from the uh, protocol messages. So this time, when you execute request on a, on one of the event loop, instead of having context switches between the event loop and the worker threads, you are actually communicating between your event loop with uh, uh, message passing, and um, and um, this um, lets you keep the number of threads to to just the number of event loops that the vertex created, and, and it's more uh, efficient. The fact that we control how we interact with the database also led us to implement more features. First one is pipelining. Um, if you you probably heard that um, with uh, HTTP, HTTP pipelining is the fact that you can push on, a, on one connection many requests at once without waiting for uh, the first result before sending the, the other one. With the Vertex PG client, uh, Postgres client, and the MySQL client, you can do the same, but with SQL. Um, so here you have um, a diagram that shows you what, what it means. In your client, you can get a connection from, from your uh, pool. And then instead, of, if you have to, for example, um, extract the, all the, the products that bought uh, a couple of users, instead of having to send to to request one after the other you you can send the two requests at once and then the database will will be able to handle them as soon as it can when some of the of the database threads are available and and then so you save the time of having to wait for the response and sending the the, the next query and what you need to know about that is that it's it can be very powerful if you it's like for HTTP if you have a lot of small results fast to retrieve it can be useful but you need to test it but it's no silver bullet so if you have to make sure it works well for your kind of workload otherwise it can slow down things so don't shoot yourself in the foot. Another thing that we can do because we manage the connection ourselves, is to connect through um, a Unix domain socket. And that is very useful on some cloud environments because when you have to, for example, um, connect uh, with encryption from, uh, from the client to, to the database, uh, sometimes it's very cumbersome in Java to, to set everything up with the, the certificates, uh, certificate authentication, etc. And in this case, um, what system administrators can do is that in your um, 
application virtual machine or container provide you with a Unix domain socket. And then they create some kind of uh, relay between the domain socket and the backend database. And you don't have to worry uh, uh, about nothing, about no certificates. The, the security will be given to you. So that, that, that can be cool. So let me show you the difference when we are using the reactive PG client. And you'll see that the difference is that there is no difference. Well, there is but small one. Like in the other uh, application, I have to create a small HTTP server, but that's not the part that uh, interests us. What's different is the way that we specify the, the connection options and the way we create um, the, the PG pool. There is no GTPC pool here. There is no uh, agro uh, connection pool uh, library, etc. Uh, and that's the major change between what we had before. The APIs, if you compare the code from um, uh, one to the other, um, the APIs are mostly the, mostly the same. So there are some minor differences, but before we, because I'm afraid we are going to uh, run short, short on time, I am not going to demonstrate that. But apart from that, it's mostly the same. And what we can do here is just show you how that works. And you'll see that every worker thread interaction has disappeared. So now when the server starts, I still have my uh, test container, Postgres and test container that, uh, that is starting. Then now it is ready. If I have to create my, uh, my product again because the database has died. And you see that the only log that I have is on the event loop. There is nothing else. There is no GDBC, etc. But the rest, it, it, it works just the same. OK? So to give a quick, quick recap on um, native clients, uh, it's the same SQL client API. You don't have context switches. You can do pipelining with uh, PostSQL, PostgreSQL, and uh, MySQL. Uh, for the, uh, these two databases, you can also have domain sockets. On the downside, the feature set depends on the maturity of the client. So for example, Postgres is our most advanced client. So we have a, a lot of features which are available even the listen notify uh, feature from Postgres is available. Um, but our, well, my, my SQL was the second, it's, uh, it's the second uh, more mature uh, client in, uh, in this list. We also have a SQL server with more limited features and the very new Oracle client. Now, a, a thing which uh, we often hear when we present Vertex or introduce people to, to Vertex is that a lot of people are used in the Java community to work with um, APIs which are annotated with uh, um, annotations about uh, JPA entities, et cetera, et cetera. And um, if you want to, to, to do that for the, for the data access part, it's now possible with um, Hibernate Reactive. So what Hibernate Reactive does it is it reuses the Hibernate uh, engine. It's the same as the uh, classical Hibernate. But instead of going to a GTBC driver, it goes through the Vertex SQL clients, uh, not the, GT, the, the one which plugs to GTBC, but the native ones. And, and then you can talk to the supported databases, which are PostgreSQL, MySQL, DB2, and uh, SQL Server. And actually, there's also a record now instead of the three dots. Three dots. So, 
So now you will see some uh, some difference differences. Sorry, because this time our our product is no more just a, a simple class, but it's a JPA entity that you are that you are used to to deal with. Um, you annotate it with uh, the things like uh, ID, the fact that it's a generated value, etc. We also have the ability to give um, JALAX validation constraints to, to the fields. So that is the, the I don't know what's it, it's the validator API, I guess. Yeah. And so instead of um, Validating manually your your entities, you can use the um, the validator implementation. In this project, I use uh, I write by the validator. So if you look at the server, this time it it, it still creates a the HTTP server, but when we when we start. Yeah. When when we start, we initialize Hibernate. So here, don't be confused if you see Jalex persistent TDBC URL uh, properties. It does not use a TDBC driver, but because it uses the Hibernate engine, which is shared with the classic uh, Hibernate, uh, it needs to have these properties, but it translates the, the um, database URL to what the Vertex actually use. Then this is very classic um, Entity Manager Factory creation code we created. And when it's ready, then this time it's, um, it's even uh, easier uh, if, you, if, you, if you're proficient with uh, with the Hibernate uh, APIs, uh, you you can work with an Hibernate session, create your query with uh, the HQL or DP, DPQL, and you say I want to map the from product uh, query to the product entity and give a result list. That's for getting the list of products. For the creation of a product, you still get the product entity from the body as JSON, but then when we validate, we use the Hibernate, uh, you can see it, but it's the validator from the Hibernate validator, which uses the annotations, and um, and that's it. If it's if it's okay, we take a session, we process the product, we flush the session, and then finally we reply with the product itself presented with the ID set to the user. Um, and that's about it. So let's go back to the to the terminal. And see how it goes. So the Postgres database starts again. Then you will see Hibernate, which initializes on worker threads, but that's mandatory because it shares the Hibernate engine. So it's also, it also shares all the APIs that's used in the um, imperative programming model. So when you initialize um, uh, an entity uh, manager factory, etc., you you don't have you don't have asynchronous and on blocking APIs to do that. So you have to, to do that on a worker thread, but after it started, it's okay. You can work with uh, asynchronous sessions. And indeed, when it's uh, initialized, you see that Hibernate has started to create itself the, the, the database schema like it would do uh, usually uh, uh, with, uh, with any kind of, um, uh, of um, uh, Java server. And this happens on the event loop threads, right? And so again, if I create a product, my product will be inserted on the event loop thread. So that 
concludes my uh, demos. Um, Takeaways from um, the ability to use Hibernate Reactive. The cool thing is that you can um, you can use the uh, annotation uh, ecosystem. Like we see, it's not just like we saw, it's not just the um, entity annotation. It's also the, the validation constraints that you can put in your in your um, Java code. Um, if you want to get started very fast, and instead of creating your database schema yourself, you can generate it from your entities, and then and that can help, help you uh, get started uh, faster. Uh, and also, you have all the power of the Hibernate um, query language. Uh, on the downside, well, it's just like for regular Hibernate. It's uh, object relational mapping is not uh, an excuse to not learn SQL. There are queries that you still have to to execute um, uh, natively for for performance, and and also it, it works well if you if you're doing a um, uh, a few rapid insertions uh, in, a, in a crude way, but um, um, if you have more advanced use cases, perhaps it's easier to go to the to the SQL, the SQL claim directly. Um, what we are doing with uh, with uh, all this is we we have this in the Vertex community for for some time now. But we also have integrated uh, everything with uh, the Quarkus um, uh, framework. So everything which I've shown uh, to you tonight, you can do it um, uh, on Quarkus as well. Everybody knows uh, Quarkus here? Yes. yes. Okay. If you don't, you can ask a question uh, just after. Uh, so the good news is because it's in the well integrated in Quarkus, if you want to go to native mode, it's uh, um, it's um, it works uh, fine. It's um, it's well tested. Um, we are trying to add more more features to the, the SQL Server client, to the Oracle client, which are more recent than uh, Postgres and, and MySQL. And um, that's it. I'm available for um, for any question that you may have. Thank you. Do you have any questions from Thomas? Nothing? Yeah. Do you have any? Uh, so, I don't know if it makes sense to take question, but I will try to explain as best as possible. Uh, I'm using to work with from Boot, so mm -hmm. if I want to use the Vertex client, it's only just a matter of uh, switching from the primary and just using now to the vertex and then uh, it's going to be reactive the the definition and the sentences so if you if you're working with spring boot you can uh, very well um, use the uh, ibernet reactive or the SQL clients directly what you won't be able to do is to, uh, for example, use the Spring Data um, features like you annotate uh, an interface and, and the methods and the, the queries are generated for you. That won't work with um, with the simple client. But if you're ready to create your repositories yourself, it, it, it works just fine. That's it. And and also. Uh, in Vertex, we provide our, all our APIs are uh, provided with uh, futures, Vertex futures, which are a bit different from the JDK futures, but it's mostly the same uh, the same um, uh, concept. But we also have um, um, reactive programming bindings with uh, RxJava free and with uh, Mutiny, but we don't have um, bindings for the SQL clients for um, What's the name? Uh, Flux and uh, and Mono, uh, but given it's uh, all reactive streams uh, based, and we hope it's everyone is compliant to the spec, you you could transform the results to you to Mono Mono Flux. Uh, it should work. That, does that answer the question? Anyone else? Yes. 
Thank you, Thomas. About uh, Hibernate Reactive, maybe a word on lazy loading operations. Is it yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Uh, I can uh, make a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the short answer is uh, no, and the long answer is you have to specify it because, of course, if you lazy loading, uh, then you're making a blocking call, right? So what you have to do is that there is a special fetch method that which is not present in the Hibernate Classic uh, uh, API that lets you fetch later what you need. But I would recommend you to uh, watch the presentation from Gavin King about uh, Ibernet 6 and uh, Ibernet Reactive. Um, he, he would explain that better than me, but basically it's, he, says, he says that uh, it's already a bad a bad pattern to make lazy loading in uh, in the blocking world uh, because usually you should preload uh, from your query everything that what that, that you need. So if you happen to 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 need something else in some non-critical places, it's fine. But usually you should fetch everything from uh, from the initial query. So it, you can do it, but but you you have to do it manually. And the other one is what about the second level cache? Like in the hibernate, you can use Azure Cache or other stuff? Uh, I don't want to, to, to tell you something uh, wrong. So I think, but I'm not sure it works. Thanks. No one else? Okay, a couple more questions we have here. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Two questions. One thing is related with the, uh, what will happen when virtual threats will arrive. I mean, this uh, could be that reactive is, let's say, run up a little bit that is not needed anymore. I'm sure. And the other piece, I understood that you mentioned that the features are pretty much the same, but not exactly. Not the ones that we were actually using from the Java ecosystem. Was... Ah, okay. Ah, the the, the vertex futures. Yes. Right. Okay. So yeah. I, then I, I understand that we have to deal with that somehow. It's basically that the, the signature is different, but basically we are implementing the same thing and then just use it as another kind of similar feature. So. Um, I start with the second question, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, second question was uh, about Vertex Futures. So when they were first created, Vertex was uh, available on, I think, Java 7, Julian, uh, initially. When, so when the Vertex Future was created, there was no completion stage or completable future. Really? Was yeah, it Java? Java didn't have completion. Yeah, it does. Well, anyway, the thing is that um, uh, there are a lot of confusions usually with the completion stage uh, in the computable future APIs because you never know if you have to provide an executor, which executor it should be, which is the thread which is going to execute the callback, etc. And uh, if you create your application like a vertical in vertex and you, you uh, work with your um, API calls and results and combine them with Vertex Future, you know that your callbacks will, all, will always be invoked on the event loop which is assigned to your vertical. So that way you you, you don't have to think about um, uh, visibility for your vertical fields for encoding or, or synchronization, things like that. So it, it removes you from uh, a lot of uh, different kinds of um, Concurrency bugs, which are hard to to debug and, and, and fix. Back to your first question, uh, we actually are working on uh, making. But but Julian, I think you are you are going to give a word about that in the second presentation about about uh, virtual threads. No, no, you're not. So we are actually um, working at this moment on. Um, providing um, um, a new version of the Vertex Core. 
engine which uses not virtual threads for the core but for what the user gets and and we are trying to see where we can get benefits etc what you have to keep in mind is that for now it's still a, it's still a, a preview feature uh, in a, in a java version which is far from being widespread in production and there are a lot of people with actual needs for go to market in six months or eight months and so to to answer a bit in a bit provocative way a reactive is not dead yet <laughs> right and 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 actually, if you think of it, if we go deeper and try to think about what uh, what's a virtual thread with the current threads, etc., it's actually a, a few threads which are executing a lot of uh, different, uh, managing a lot of different uh, events and and uh, and, um, and uh, requests, etc. So the model is is different from the programming model, but from the execution point of view, it's it, it has similarities. You have a incubator for touching yeah. yeah, just want to say that you have a virtual thread incubator project on GitHub, and uh, we also blogged about it. So if you go on Bertens and your blog, if you can read the blog, then go to uh, the project and just try it and try to write it and see if it makes sense. And the thing is that when you use virtual threads, what I think, right, that's my opinion, designed for Java in the applications and trying to make them more scalable. And uh, often, uh, when you have an application, you have to deal with events, right? Like when you have HTTP server requests, you deal with the HTTP server request event uh, or external requests. And it seems that in Vertex, everything is an event. So there is a wide uh, spectrum of things between just having an event that is the HTTP server request in the server container, and then you deal everything in a blocking way. And Vertex, when everything is uh, is an event, I think there are. There are uh, in places where you can deal with partially with virtual threads and use uh, blocking interactions, and at the same time keep and uh, retain this uh, this ability to process events because it's very powerful and very flexible. There was a, a question there. I think. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is related to purpose. I don't know if Mike can ask. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure. Uh, well, I was doing some research about uh, NLP applications, and I found the Quarkus and Spring NLP, that I think it's experimental, not very much. Uh, but and I found that uh, it uses less resources, and the good stuff is very really good. Um, but uh, I don't know if it's as easy as uh, switching to that, or if there are uh, some features that are missing if you use uh, native applications, or there are uh, some use cases that you cannot use uh, native applications, or so what as the, the, the disadvantage of not using so why uh, we are not using native applications if uh, users with resources, uh, the, the boot time is very quick. And so uh, I can answer that, but, but it's a bit off the SQL <laughs> topic, of course. Uh, so perhaps we take that to later, or I give a quick answer. As, uh, okay. So the question was: Is there limitations to uh, using not only SQL client extension in Quarkus or Ignite Reactive extension in Quarkus in native mode? Or with any other extension, right? Um, so the answer is no. The contract for Parkus extension is that every um, feature that's provided by an extension should be available both in uh, JDM and native mode. Sometimes, because we we lack uh, time to make it properly, it can happen that something is available initially in JVM mode only, uh, but more usually something is not available in native mode, it's because it's not possible in, um, in uh, native um, because of, um, of uh, limitations of well VM. Um, but usually, yeah, the Quarkus extension, most of the things are available in native. There's nothing, I, I am the maintainer of the SQL client extension in Quarkus, and there is nothing I know of which is not available in 
yeah, there is something I know. <laughs> there is the, the Unix domain socket stuff because you it's because of the native native integration because the Unix domain socket stuff requires uh, GNI calls and that is difficult to to adapt to the native mode. But that's about it. We, yeah. Okay. Thank um, you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Thomas.